I don't know, I don't think any of this is easy. I don't think language learning is all that easy. It's arduous. It takes a long time. It takes a huge amount of patience. It's very annoying because you spend a long time not being able to say anything that you want to say yeah. and always being permanently late in every conversation and understanding what's going on and but do you, being able to do say you feel like that? It. Do you feel like that in Italian? Do you feel like that in French? I feel slightly disabled in all of them. Oh really? Even though I'm superficially fluent and I can, you know, compared to most British people I'm absolutely excellent but uh, I can still see a gap between me and the locals, yeah, you know, and, yeah. I, and I'm very well aware that although it doesn't look like a gap, if you were listening to me speak Italian, you'd probably think I was doing a great job, but I can see the gap, you know, uh, there is a gap, I, there's a huge amount that I don't know uh, in terms of culture, vocabulary, grammar, and the whole fucking shoot, that they think I speak quite well, but I mean, whatever, what, what, what does that yeah. mean, you know, I mean, you're aware, aren't you, there's, there's and there's like a contract. Yeah, fair. Yeah. There's a feeling of a contract, like somebody starts speaking English and then their English is very good and then you catch a slight Dutch accent and you think Oh yeah, I was at a You've party tricked once. me. At a you're, party. you're not English, you're Dutch. And, and there were these two brummies at a party, you know, like I just said, yeah. where are you from? Like I thought they'd go like either Birmingham or somewhere near Birmingham. And they go, um, Holland. And I said, Oh fucking hell, yeah, how come you speak like a probably said, Well I just my friend was from Birmingham, so I picked up the accent. Yeah. But of course, they also watch British TV. So they yeah. were watching all our TV since they were kids. And they yeah. knew the jokes, and they knew all our TV better than I did, because they watched a lot of TV. Yeah, and then you realise that they know everything about your country, and you know fucking nothing about their country. It's all their language, which is sort of embarrassing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, what, what gets yeah. me sometimes is that, like, I'm in Mexico, and I've been in Mexico for a long time, and then I've done a degree in Spanish, and then, and and you know, and I've lived in Spain and so on. And then I'm talking in Spanish, and then suddenly they realise that I'm not Mexican, uh, and then and then they begin to listen to instead of listening to what I'm saying, uh, uh, they start to listen to uh, further evidence. To uh, they start to listen to the way I talk uh, or yeah. the words. Well, they say something and about it's like it it's, it's like when somebody's looking at you while you're walking, you know. And suddenly you find you can't walk anymore because they're I mean maybe that's never happened to you but let's imagine somebody's really staring at you while you're eating your food or something you get very self-conscious and maybe you drop something or uh, you know well maybe there's an argument there for not speaking somebody else's language too well then they don't get discomforted by the fact that you're too good um, was it you that was telling me the story of the guy that spoke perfect Chinese no, maybe it was Graham. He told me about this guy who Chinese triumphantly identified that he wasn't Chinese, even though he spoke very good Chinese. Because of course he was a white guy, and therefore, in their opinion, he could never be Chinese. And it, and then he, the guy said to him, um, "Oh well, you can speak Chinese. I bet you can't read it." So the guy then demonstrated that he could read it. He said, well, I bet no. you can't write it. He then demonstrated that he could also write it, and he could write ancient Chinese. Yeah. But the guy's parted shot was, yeah, but you're not Chinese. <laughs> 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 because you could never be Chinese. And I think that's kind of interesting, isn't it? People don't like the idea that you're on their turf, and that you can do their thing quite well, or very well. And you might even know more about well, it than they do. They find that's that the example of, yeah, of yeah. one of our colleagues who, who was yeah. born in, you know, uh, you know who I'm talking about, who was born in, um, or who lived most of her life in the Emirates uh, and could understand Arabic but was teased mercilessly because of her accent so that now she's too uh, shy to actually speak it and and that's about like giving people the right to actually speak a language you know when I went to work at the university somebody said to me this guy an interesting guy somehow mentioned in conversation he just read this paper yeah that said, and there's no surprise here, that it might be worth paying more attention to pronunciation because people treat you as a local if you speak like them. Yeah. So if you've got some kind of authentic British accent, the Brits will treat you like a Brit. It doesn't matter what you look like. If you go, all right, then yeah, mate, you know, and you sound genuine, then you, as far as they're concerned, you're one of us. And they just overlook the fact that you might be Chinese, black, or whatever, you know. It's like the voice, that's it. It sounds like me. But it's also... And then, then so in yeah. a way, I was going to say though, 
the, the, the way you speak leads to acceptance, but it has to be 100% successful. But the people also wary of people coming onto their turf. So if they feel that you've somehow inveigled your way in, and then they find out they might be hacked, especially the Japanese and people might be hacked off. So yeah. it might be better to remain as a foreigner by making sure that you uh, not so good that they can't have a laugh at your expense because then they're not worried about you insinuating yourself well, unless into their unless you're actually yeah. in their society and you have every right to be there and you know and what about a second generation korean who speaks okay. perfect english second generation and somebody saying story. Yeah, and somebody yeah. going oh you know what's she doing speaking I mean, and no, well, why should it be another story? No, the point story? is, when you why should it be another country, story? Why should it be another when story? When you grow up in the country, then you speak like everybody else. No, it's no, different. Uh, it's different. Like, for example, I know uh, women, young women who've arrived when they've been, when they were girls, they were like 12 years old, and then they were told that they were not, you know, that they were going to be integrated and that they were not English, but they're going to, we're going to be taught English and the mere act of telling them that they were not English and they were going to be taught separately gave them a sort of rigid identity as like not of the place. What kind of people and these they? people, these are refugees, asylum seekers, and these people, right, they still had accents later on. And they had accents because it was, they'd been given those identities and told, don't think that you're one of us. You know, don't lose your accent. Don't think that you're one of us because you're not. You're, you're somebody out. else. Right. Okay. Well, I don't know about that. Maybe. I. 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 I, I might have just been too old to, to get the uh, accent right. No, I, I know age, because yeah, I'm yeah. comparing it with my own kids, who whose accent is perfectly English. Yeah, how long have your kids been in England then? Well, the same about the same time as there. As and the other got kids, one British dad though that yeah. makes a difference. But the point when is, you've got a family member. The point is, speaker, it makes the point is, there's yeah. some people who lose their accent completely, and some people retain it. Well, there's something, and like, I think that's the reason why they retain it is because then complex. is yeah, but it's about identity, you know. Some people, well, there are Geordies who go to live in London. Oh, fuck me, and they. Uh, that was seriously fast. That was fast, and they. Um, carry on with the Geordie accent, other people who don't, you know, yeah. I mean, it's it's not just foreigners, it's yeah. uh, people moving yeah. from region to region, depends how you feel about your identity and what matters in your identity, yeah, so, and, uh, all those, all those, um, I was listening to the, um, to the, uh, watching an old, um, uh, session of The Jam, right, on TV, and the presenter was, clearly middle class right but he was speaking in this really fakey working cl working class accent because he was he's going yeah right it's showing the jam yeah right you know and you were just thinking it was so obvious but at the time it wasn't obvious you know at the time it, yeah, said, it was, was, it was quite subtle you know movement. so yeah it's like here yeah, so there's a terribly interesting punk band it sort of totally deprives all your no, words of any sense but of But the uh, guy but the guy who was say, saying yeah, yeah. that was saying was trying to, you know, adding a bit of mockery to it, you know, he was adding a bit of Yeah, but they like, realise that they sound inauthentic in the sense that they're not authentic you know, posh people are not really qualified to talk about punk, are they? Because it's a working class thing, is not it? Yeah. And uh, they understood themselves that as soon as music became a working class phenomenon and that became big, suddenly they sounded like a bunch of plonkers. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we were, we were talking about your the misidentification of my accent, Kenyan accent, as being uh, of a certain class in Britain. It's posh. Yeah, but it isn't, it's just a it Kenyan accent. No, it's, it's a Kenyan posh. accent. Yeah, but no, who the fuck knows what a Kenyan accent is? They're exactly. So f no, no, they're, they're just they're, they're, they're not. They're not. They, yeah. No, they weren't. They're not. Yeah, they're just yeah. they're people who who grew up in a different environment, but they weren't. You know, but they were just. I don't know. They weren't. They're not not aristocrats. They're not. Yeah, but the, well, the point I'm making is that it's 
if it sounds posh, it's because it was formed by posh people. Because if, if Kenya had been populated by people who talk like that, then you would talk like that, wouldn't you? And it's uh, the fact that it, you have a, a Kenyan accent is a posh accent is because it's posh people who invented the accent in the first place. And, uh, and, and it wasn't for the people who talk like that. And uh, because I don't suppose you get a whole heap of, you know, working class people living in Kenya, do you? British working class. But you know, what, you know what drives me mad? Uh, yeah. Is when some, I hear this like consciously Glaswegian accent or consciously. What do you mean? Well, in the sense that the person who's speaking. You either have a Glaswegian accent or well, you don't. Yeah, well, yeah. So there's the person who's speaking is, is has joined, has joined uh, maybe, you know, has um, is a talking head and obviously somebody who's well paid and, and well known but they're, they're kind of like a professional Glaswegian you know or I'm the Geordie or I'm the Glaswegian well, that's the way the media you think works the media they, chooses somebody yeah, to be that person yeah exactly exactly well that's just a job isn't it if they're prepared to, to, to pay me to be some token or something I'd probably be yeah. happy to take Token what? For it. Yeah, Token yeah. what? Mancunian? Of course not, because I'm not from Manchester. Well, Durhamite. Well, Durham. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, I'm wholly inauthentic as anything. <laughs> I don't belong anywhere. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't belong in the northeast because I'm too posh. And I don't belong in the south because I'm not posh enough. <laughs> There's a, uh, a friend, uh, Richard Tooley, you know his songs, they're very good songs. Yeah, yeah. And he's got quite, he's got an accent, but he says he sounds really posh for for somebody from East London. Yeah, yeah. So they, so they think he sounds like, oh my God, you know, this is, this is like, you know, this is uh, nothing to do with their accent whatsoever, you know. People are sensitive to accent, especially the, the, the white working class, because if you never fucking go anywhere, it matters where people come from and if you sort of person who stays their whole life on one council estate then you're like a tribal person Actually, in New Guinea aren't you? You've got a little tribal area yeah. that you seldom go out of and you're acutely aware of where the boundaries are and uh, Actually you might be, it might be interesting That's for you. obviously totally non-PC to say that. Yeah. But um, <coughs> my teacher at UCL wrote book called Accents of English. Oh yeah. It's like the definitive so you think they would book on Accents give of English. Give my theory any credence then? What about your theory, sorry? That people are acutely aware of the boundaries of their local area in terms of accent. You know, you, in the North East, you can move five miles and you, you're, a, you're a foreigner, you know, and the people know you're not from where they come from and it's only fucking five miles away. Because the, the, the change in accent, although very well, subtle, is something they're aware yeah, of. Well, that, in that yeah. style ectology, those are called isoglosses and... No, but I'm not asking about that. I'm saying, do you think, do you think that he, they, that person would agree with this idea? People are very sensitive um, to Well, they, I think what yeah. they do is they, they, they're they trying to be objective. So they, for example, um, if there's a sound which um, you say, ah, for example, or ah, yeah? So bath or bath, they would they would go around and find, you know, where that shifted over, where it. Oh, we're not talking about differences as big as that. We're talking about tiny imperceptible differences, which to an outsider would be literally imperceptible. You know, extremely small differences. I'm saying people are far more uh, aware of these things than you know you would expect. I thought it was yeah. extraordinary how people could locate somebody to within a few miles. You know, where as an outsider you couldn't hear any difference between those two people's accents. Yeah, I suppose they're more sensitive to it than... Yeah, uh, yeah because they've never fucking gone anywhere. So they're really clued up about their ears are on stalks, you know. Yeah. Oh, that was very interesting. But yeah, because they want to know where's this guy from. It's a survival skill, because if you go, this person is from my area or not from my area, and there's a whole gradation of what my area means, isn't there? Well, Patrick was uh, saying, you know, that that um, just a few questions and they they pinned him down. Yeah. When he was in Belfast, they needed to know who he was. Yeah. Yeah. And all he had to do was answer one or two questions, and then they well, your name they'd have it. You know, yeah, yeah. Your name, your accent, the way yeah. you, you know, 
Patrick as the Catholic name, you know. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. No, it's kind of interesting, yeah, it's a survival skill in a place like Belfast where it's dangerous to live there. Mm -hmm. Accent and work and the identity is the difference between life and death, isn't it? And, uh, yeah. So, how are you getting on with um, Farsi? Not. I'm not making any progress because I'm not doing anything. I have bursts of doing things with it. I've decided that language learning from books is only good if you really work hard at it. I'm not working yeah. very hard at it. It's quite boring. I need to go there. I, I, still I get fed up with it. Yeah. Time time. Yeah. Looking back on it, I learned a lot from uh, the university's little beginners course, which was extremely conventional, but yeah. I learned a lot from it. It was dull, you know, in a way. It was just like going to school in the 1970s, you know. Yeah. Things on the board, go over and learn your vocabulary, all that shit, you know. And it, but it did kind of novel quite a lot of stuff. And I also learned quite a lot of stuff from doing the TPR. But going back to the books and just going through the books, I just find I get hacked off with it and I just stick in my head well at all. Uh, when I'm looking at it, it seems to make yeah. sense and I just forget all about it. Well, I still can't remember do anything fucking useful as far as Arabic is yeah. concerned I'm I'm really a bit freaked out because you know okay I learned Russian that was all right I learned Spanish that's okay I kind of understand French and then with Arabic it's been so slow I'm yeah, I, don't forget you're not I'm, doing it full time you, you learn much well, studying I hear at my university yeah but I hear my students I hear my students all the time you know it's all around me wherever I go and yeah, but it's not around you in the same way, is it? No, but the thing is, like, when I'm listening to the yeah. TV, I can kind of go, I understand what they're talking about, but there's no effort involved. Do you know what I mean? It's like, but it's not completely clear. It's like when I when somebody's talking Russian on the telly, I can understand everything they're saying. Yeah, because there's okay. a massive difference between doing a bit of something and doing a lot. Yeah, but then I'm listening, uh, and then there is there. I can get the yeah, general how topic, did, how you know? Long, how long did it take you as a full-time student to learn Russian? You know, in terms Four of years. thousands of hours, Four you years. put in fucking thousands of hours into learning Russian. Yeah, and yeah. you haven't put in thousands of hours into learning Arabic. That's the difference, isn't it? Four years of full-time study is bound to make a difference, isn't it? You get up and you're like morning till night, you're thinking about Russian. Well, if you did the same with Arabic, you'd be laughing, wouldn't you? But you don't. You do a little bit, tiddling bit here and there. I'm just trying so to think uh, of a yeah. solution to this problem of go, learning Arabic. Go to another country where you're more involved with Arabs. Here, we don't meet Arabs. We just have our students. You need to go out and buy the bread, ask the way. You need to go somewhere like Oman, where you're going to use Arabic with everybody in normal life. And that's how you start building it up. I think that's the absolute <laughs> secret. Because you can't just go in and start talking to people when you haven't got any proper conversation, but you can go in and ask for the newspaper and a bottle of milk, can't you? And that's where the, the language learning thing starts to really work, you know? Yeah. You, well, using the language every day for simple tasks, simple conversations, and then it slowly builds on that. Or, you can't go in at yeah. the top floor, can you? Yeah. Kind of start or systematic study, because... I, you know, I, yeah, well, I, I told you, you got the time for it. Yeah. I had a friend in yeah. in in, uh, in the Ukraine in the 80s, and obviously she'd never been allowed yeah, to visit again, she visit spent England. A lot of time on the language lab and all she that. She did, stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think yeah, yeah. You know, the alternative the, time in. the alternative is systematic. Yeah, well, I don't put the time into fasting study, either. Yeah. I've spent an hour or two on it, fuck about with it a bit, then I just leave it for a few weeks and I do a little tiny bit more. Of course I'm not learning it. So if I sat down for an hour a day, every single day, so I'd eventually Pete, get it in my head. You know? So yeah. Pete, yeah. if you were to give, let's say, you have more than 35 years experience teaching languages and you speak five languages and I have 30 years experience and I speak three languages and I'm le and, and I'm okay in one in another. So, if you could give somebody advice who's thinking of learning another language, what advice would you give them? Go there. 
No, but I mean, like, go there and what? I mean, you can go somewhere. And first, go there. Yeah, okay, maybe have a small on, language man. course to give yourself the rudiments of the language and then go there as quickly as possible. I think going there is 99% of it. You know? And once you're there, and that means going to a place where you can use well, here the language. I am. Yeah, but you're not, are you? You're not here. Because when you go to the shops, you talk to the Indians and the Filipinos, you're not in a place where you can have the kind of meaningful interactions with Arabs that are going to help you learn the language. You understand me? Yeah. I listen to I've listened to many thousands of hours of Farsi at home. Does that mean I know Farsi? So no, Italian. Because you, but no, but listen, yeah. you don't learn a language from thousands of hours of incomprehensible input. You have to go in at the bottom, sort a few basic okay. things out, and then. When you get to a certain point where you have independence and lift off, then you can bootstrap your way to the rest of it. But if you don't reach that crucial point by well, developing interactions at a very basic level, well, my, you can't get to the next point. Well, my yeah. my um, my point about like if I was to give somebody advice uh, about learning another language, um, I would basically say that um, well I'm not I'm not really in a position to because I'm not doing very well with Arabic but you know but, about it yeah you've done it before yeah I've done it before but I would say that the biggest boost okay first of all do study the grammar and the phonology the pronunciation and everything else first so that you have a system even though it's only a skeletal system you know you have some sort of framework which you can peg things on later on, you know? So I think a bit of study before you go somewhere is good, you know? And um, serious study, you know? Uh, maybe months, maybe even a year. Well, the point is it has right? to be enough to get you to the point yeah. where you can start exactly. interacting. Exactly. No, it has people. to be the basics. So the tenses, basic vocabulary, you know, basic functional language, and so on. To the point where, as you say, you can interact with people on a very basic level, then you can go to the country. And then... Um, I saw these guys on, on uh, where was it, on YouTube or somewhere? Uh, yeah. And these guys, two guys, wanted to see if they could learn the basics of four languages in a year. And they decided to go to these four different countries and they went together, but then split up. And they, they said at the end of their experiment, their conclusion was that if you spend three months in a country on your own, uh, you will get some Bye. kind of lift off in the language, even Chinese. And I, I thought that was kind of interesting. They I don't just think go it's... There How can you believe that, Pete? Go. How can I'm, you believe that? I'm prepared to believe it. Oh, I think mean, it's bollocks. It sounded but a bit anyway, short to me. Nah, it's bollocks, man. Look, look. I don't know what kind of priming they went with. Uh, exactly. Uh, oh, no, I it's, say it's you, total. But you could test this total out. Total fucking. No, bollocks. you could test this out by going somewhere yourself and seeing if you could. Man, make I've it been work. here five years. I don't speak any. I don't speak. Yeah, Arabic. but the point I'm making is you don't have the people to have the meaningful interactions. Well, with. I've had enough to make at least three months worth of meaningful interactions. But I, anyway, I haven't finished what I was going to say. So I would say that if you, okay, let's say you're in the country and you want to learn um, something. Do you know the way you don't learn is if you think your culture is superior? Sure. If you think that you're the way you do, that everyone should be doing what you do in your own country and that look at the way they drive and look at the way they behave and look at the way they eat and so on so you know and you float above above the culture like a tourist you know so I, I guess I, I guess I would agree with you at some level but that you well, look, well, you need to engage you need to engage you've got to be sufficiently interested in the place to feel that it's worth making the immense effort involved and it is an immense effort um, and making yourself yeah. vulnerable as well, making yourself feel, as you said, like feel like you're an idiot when you're talking to people. You know, not be frightened of having bad experiences in a in a culture that you're not familiar with. I mean, wouldn't you say? Yeah, sure. And good experiences. I think the too. point though is that again, you have to 